Me. Um, well, I've lived here in Williamsburg all my life. I belonged to Dr. Kenneth McKenzie. He was my first master over in Palace Green. I, uh, I was a small child then. He taught me how to read and how to write my name. Uh, when I became ill back in the 40s with the smallpox, uh, he was there to help make me well, seeing as how he was a doctor. Uh, when he paid his debt to nature in 1755, uh, Mr. Thomas Everard appraised me for 40 pounds and bought me himself. My duties then were to uh, help with the raising of his daughters, Fanny, Miss Fanny and Miss Martha, after the death of their mother, Mrs. Diana Everard. Uh, I've been there ever since. I have two children. Caesar is my oldest, and Tom is my baby boy. He's 10. They are the light of my life. Uh, my duties now are to tend to the house as a housemaid. I make sure that everything is in order, and uh, I, I run errands for my master. I take messages for him. Can I be honest with you? I hate this lot that I've been given. Don't get me wrong, I, I love my children. I do. They're the light of my life and I love my family and I love my friends. But slavery isn't something that I would have chosen for myself would not have chosen to be at the beck and call of anybody every day for the rest of my life. It's hard. It's hard to, to walk down the street and feel invisible and at the same time know that everyone's got their eye on you, making sure that you standing up straight but keeping your head down. And then all of this talk about war and, and revolution and freedom and liberties that have nothing to do with people that look like me. You know, they've been talking about this for years. Ever since that, ever since the war with the French and the Indians, and they were angry when, when England decided to tax them for that, and then, oh, what else? And then after, after the, the, the tax on the tea and they threw the tea in the harbor in Boston and, and then just last year when, when Lord Dunmore took the gunpowder from the magazine, which he said he did because he heard rumors of a slave insurrection. They were up in arms about that. Then Lord Dunmore passing the proclamation and I do my best to stay out of political conversations. I don't think that they serve me. That's all you hear about in any tavern you go into, any, any, any marketplace that you're in. All they're talking about is life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. <laughs> any laws that are, that are written aren't going to be for the benefit of me unless they're talking about the manumission of my people, and I don't see that coming down the line anytime soon. But I did hear that declaration, this declaration of independence that they're talking about. A friend of mine, Lydia, she belongs to Mr. With, 
she said that she got a chance to see a draft of it in his office when she was cleaning one day. And she said that there was a line, oh, what did it say? It said that the king has waged war against human nature and that he has taken the life and liberty of of a distant people who never offended him and, and forced them into slavery. And anyway, she says that that means they were talking about us, not necessarily freeing us, but that they realized that slavery was wrong and that maybe we should, maybe we should be hopeful that this declaration would do something for us later on down the line. And I want to be hopeful. I do. I, I want to believe that, that there's freedom down the line for folks that look like me, but Hope feels like an indulgence that I don't have time for. I have work to do. There's always work for me to do, and I have children that I'm supposed to protect. My, my sons are old enough to know what some of these words mean. They're sharp. They're smarter than I've ever been. And they hear these men talking about liberties and freedoms, and I have to remind them every time that, that the laws that govern those white men aren't the same laws that are going to govern them. I just... It feels silly to hope for something that seems so far out of reach, you know? <sighs> Forgive me, uh, you came here with, with queries and I drifted off the topic, but um, if you have any, I'm certainly happy to answer them for you. Oh, no, thank you, uh, Mertilla, for chatting with us and allowing us to come visit you. Uh, we really appreciate it. And I just want to encourage everyone, if you do have a question for Mertilla, please write it down in the comments and we will try to answer as many of those questions as possible while we are here with her today. Now, Mertilla, you've lived quite a life, it seems, thus far and, and quite an experience. Um, I know things are changing here, but can you just tell us what what is your life like here in the capital city and, and how has it changed since you were uh, under your first uh, owner to now? Can you tell us about that? Well, uh, as long as I've been alive, Williamsburg has been the capital of the colony of Virginia. Uh, there's about oh, roughly 2,000 people that live here and most of them look like me and most of them are enslaved like me. Uh, Negroes are working in, in every capacity here in the city. We, we work in taverns, we, we work in houses. Uh, any trade that you come across, the, the blacksmith, the print shop, carpentry, shoemaking, we, we're a part of all of that. Uh, again, slavery is the law of the land. That's all I know. I've never known anything else. Hmm. Well, you mentioned your sons earlier, and, <laughs> and Aaron was actually wondering um, how many um, children you have, or how many sons uh, do you have? Can you tell us a little bit about them? Uh, certainly. Uh, Caesar is my oldest. Um, he was born and baptized at the Bruton Parish Church in 1765, and Tom is my baby boy, and he was, again, baptized at the Bruton Parish Church, but a year later, in 17 and 66, those are the only children that I have. They are quite a handful, as, as boys usually tend to be, but they're growing to be quite the handsome young men, if I do say so myself. <laughs> uh, thank you, Aaron. Yes, and along with that, speaking of your sons, um, Emily D. of Williamsburg, she was curious about what piece of advice would you like to give your children? Or maybe what's the best piece of advice that you have given your uh, sons? Nobody's ever asked me that before. We, any advice I usually give them is usually in secret. Um, best bit of advice that I have ever given them would be to to speak softly, uh, walk lightly, and don't tell these white folk everything you know. Keep something to yourself. 
It's very important. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, well, thank you for that. Thank you. Now, um, Mertilla, you were speaking a little bit about this um, this quest for freedom that a lot of people are seeking, and 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 what's happening right now uh, with the war. I'm I'm curious. You said earlier that um, your first uh, uh, the first person who owned you taught you how to read. Uh, uh, we're curious. Have you read some of the Declaration for yourself? And if so, what are your thoughts on this revolution? I personally haven't uh, read the Declaration, any drafts of it myself. I've only heard talk of it uh, from Lydia and from uh, the folks who come to my master's home and uh, speak about it during meetings or in the parlor. It, the idea of it sounds wonderful. You know, these, these indictments against the king for all of the wrongdoings that have been laid upon the colonists here. I just, I wonder if when they speak of these things, do they consider the folks that look like me that they're holding in bondage? And of course there was that mention that, that Lydia spoke about but something in my spirit tells me that that's not going to come to pass. And that's a bit disheartening, to say the least. Hmm. Yes. Okay. Um, it's uh, quite a thought there. Yes, I know it's a lot to consider. Well, when you think about your, your children and you think about this thought that people are speaking about freedom is to come and this war is going on. Um, do you ever think about those things for yourself and your uh, young sons? Do they inquire about uh, freedom for themselves and, and what do you say? Freedom, freedom for me and for my children just feels so far away. It, Again, the idea is wonderful, and to hope for it is... I don't know if it'll ever be a truth for me. I do hope that one day it'll be a truth for my children and their children, but since the law says that any child born of my flesh is always going to belong to somebody else, until it changes, I don't... I don't see any hope. And that sounds, that sounds so dark. And I don't, I don't like to be in such a melancholy about it, but, but I think it's important to be, to be honest with yourself and to be honest with your children in, in a way that they can understand. Indeed. Yes. Well, Tina was wondering, um, do you ever... Do you ever fear that there's a potential for your children to be sold away from you? And Tina was curious, are there special skills that would make them appear to be more valuable to Mr. Everard? And can you tell us, what, does, what do you think that means when this idea of you being seen as a valuable um, piece of property to, some, to the person who owns you? Well, Tina, thank you for your question. Uh, I will say that is a fear of every mother who has children born into this condition that they will take our children from us. There's nothing that we can do if they do. They're considered property just like we are. And take me, for example, when I was bought and sold, uh, excuse me, when I was bought in 1755, by Mr. Everard, I was appraised for 40 pounds, and arithmetic's never been my strong suit, but um, I do understand that my appraisal came with the skills that I have, as you, as you made mention of. I was able to read, and I was able to write, and that made me more valuable, and my sons have some of those same skills. They can read, and they can write. They did not attend the Bray School. Uh, that was a school for Negro children. 
Uh, Ms. Ann Wager ran that for a few years. It, it closed down, but I did make it a point to make sure that my children could write their names. I think that's important to, to know how to write down your name. And Caesar is uh, very fond of horses, and Tom would make, would make an excellent ho uh, footman if Mr. Everard were to see fit. And I hope and pray every day that my children stay with me. And I don't see anything that would lead to the contrary, but people who own people have to balance their books every year. And if there are debts owed, or if there are, uh, if, if there's not enough of something to go around, and it's not a choice that I have in the matter. If Mr. Everard decides to sell my children, he can sell them, and there's nothing that I can do about it. I don't want that. But that's the price I pay for being a slave. Now, Mertilla, you, you've spoken a lot about your boys. Um, there is a curiosity just about your family at large. Do you have other family members, and are there... Um, maybe people in your community who are really like family. Can you tell us a little bit about them? Certainly. Uh, again, I can talk all day about my children. Uh, I never knew my mother. She was sold off from Dr. McKenzie's property before I could remember her. Um, but when I was there, Miss Betty and Little Silver were like family to me. They took care of me and... Um, I wonder how they're doing. Anyway, uh, when I was purchased, um, Mr. Everard already had quite a few people that he owned, and Beck and Venus, who were a little older than me, they took me under their wings and taught me um, the ways of Mr. Everard's property. They were there when I had my sons. Uh, I have friends about the city. I I've spoken of Lydia and... There's her husband, Benjamin. They belong to Mr. With, along with Fanny and Abram and their two boys. Uh, over to the Randolph property, there's Eve and Agnes. Agnes and I have sort of a love-hate relationship about each other, but that's another story for another time. Uh, you, you tend to make your own family with the people around you. You know, the, the people that work on the property with you become like your family. You spend so much time together, working together, eating together, laughing together. That's one of the beautiful things. There's not much about it, slavery, that's beautiful. But having a family close to you is a beautiful thing. Well, speaking of beautiful things, Martilla, there are a few of our guests here who are a bit curious about if there's any love in your life. And, <laughs> and it's certainly feel free to speak as openly or, or, or maybe not as, as you wish, but I will um, ask, you know, including Debbie and Tony, uh, Tanya, they are curious about um, if you are married and also how uh, can someone... Um, in your position right now, perhaps be married? Uh, are, are they arranged? Do you get to select who you're married to? And uh, we would love to know. Well, ladies, I certainly thank you for your inquiry. Uh, as of now in my life, I have the love of my children and the love of the Lord, and that is enough for me <laughs> <laughs> as far as uh, marriage, or at least for us, jump in the broom. Uh, I haven't done that yet. Legally, as property, I'm not allowed to enter into a binding contract such as marriage. But, well, Miss Betty used to tell me you can't help who you love. <laughs> and, and sometimes we do fall in love. Uh, when that happens, usually you're supposed to get permission from your master if, uh, if you and the gentlemen in question are on separate 
properties, you'll get permission from both of your masters, and if they see fit to it, you will jump the broom. That's a tradition that we, that we Negroes brought from, from West Africa, where a broomstick will be decorated, and when the two people stand on one side of the broom, they are uh, separate, and then when they take hands and jump over the broom, they are now one in the eyes of God. And that's not in the stars for me as of yet, but we don't know what the future holds, so we'll see. Uh, Maybe one day. One day. Well, we certainly hope that uh, for you. Um, now, uh, Mertilla, uh, Barbara was very curious, and, and Mary also has a question about your, your work, your, your daily work um, in the Everard household. And um, could you speak to maybe what, what your daily life is like and, and daily work? And also, um, Mary is specifically curious if there is a job or a trade that you would prefer to do if, if you weren't enslaved. So, uh, Well, Mary, thank you for your question. I... As I said before, I am a house servant for Mr. Everard. My duties include uh, making sure that everything is in order in his office and about the home. Uh, I do a lot of cleaning. I make sure that the floors are clean and uh, that, the, uh, that the windows are spotless, that, uh, that nothing is out of place. Everything is where it's supposed to be. Um, I, I have dabbled in, in other duties about the property. I have helped with the laundry. I've helped Ms. Venus with the laundry. Uh, Beck is very adamant about folks staying out of her kitchen, so I tend to, <laughs> tend to steer clear of that. But as, uh, oh, I, I make sure to uh, run errands for my master. I take messages for him. Um, if he needs anything passed along to anyone else in the city, I'm usually the first person he asks. But any other trade, I... You know, I've gone into the millinery a few times for uh, caps and, and things of the like for Miss Fanny and Miss Martha, and I love to look at all of the gowns the beautiful gowns that they make. <laughs> and if I were to have the choice in what I do, I would like to learn how to sew gowns. All right, very well. And um, there's um, some curiosities here and uh, just a few questions that I would love to uh, hear from you, Mertilla. Um, one, Tina is very curious if perhaps you ever go to a gathering that's led by uh, Reverend Gallon Pamplet, who I believe is a Baptist preacher he here. He is. Yes. And, and she's uh, curious about um, how you have time to, to be in prayer, or if you do, and, and what's, what does spirituality look like for you? It's a very interesting question, Tina. Thank you. Uh, well... The first part, I, I have been to gatherings and prayer meetings that uh, Reverend Gowan has led, and they certainly have stirred up the spirit. If you've, if you've ever been to one of his prayer meetings, you know that he can, he can call down God in a mighty way. Uh, but for me, in, in the quiet times in the morning when I'm uh, stoking the fires or drawing water um, or as I'm sure I did when I first came in to straighten up. Uh, singing keeps me closer to God than anything else. I, whenever, whenever I get sad, I like to sing. I, it gives me joy. It keeps me going. And I've been told that I have a lovely voice. Some may say otherwise, but I certainly think that at a gathering, I, I can make things happen, if you will. Oh, 
Well, <laughs> well, I'm certainly sure at some point in time we would. <laughs> uh, hopefully, everyone will be able to to, to hear at the next one. At, at the, the next, next one, yeah, certainly. <laughs> indeed, Martella. Indeed. Well, um, I know a lot has occurred uh, in this last year, especially with Dunmore's proclamation being issued in November of. Uh, 1775. Just last and, year. Yes, and it it, it kind of uh, aligns with the question that comes from Quish, Christian about, uh, and I, I know this is a very uh, it's a very serious subject, but Christian is curious. Have you ever considered running away? And I know this proclamation is offered to uh, for enslaved people to go to the British. Is that something that you have thought about for yourself, for your children, or have you ever? assisted anyone uh, in those matters? Um, <clears throat> may I speak freely here? Please. Uh, well, I have a brother. Not my blood brother, but blood couldn't have made us any closer. His name is Davy, and In the summer of 1769, Davy came to me and told me that he planned to run and that he wanted me to go with him. He, uh, he had heard Mr. Everard speaking to uh, Mr. Jefferson about potentially selling him off since he had gotten a new manservant. And, well, Davy decided he wanted the light of freedom more than the darkness of his bondage. Those were his words. And he came to me that morning and he asked me to go with him. He said he wouldn't want anyone else to go with him but me. So I told him that I would. I told him I would as long as I could get my sons and I was going to pack them up. And my brother said to me, well, we can only take Caesar. We can't take the white one. Now I'm going to say something to you, Christian, and to all of you who are listening, that I don't usually say in mixed company, but I have two children, and one come out black and one come out white, but they both come from me, and as I told you before, the law says that any child born of an enslaved woman is gonna be enslaved for the rest of their life, that the status of the child is that of the mother, be she bond or free, that's what the law says. So, when he said that, I told my brother that I wouldn't leave without both of my children. And so I stayed. I had the opportunity to run. And freedom, freedom is what we all want. But I won't take freedom if I can't take my children with me. I'll always choose them. And, and Martilla, I, I know we have time for a few, just a few more questions, but I noticed you said that... Uh, one of your children, one is white and one is black. Do you, as a mother, do you notice um, different treatment uh, for your boys as they move through the world and how they experience the world based on how they look? Well, no different treatment because, as I said, they both come from me. And a slave is a slave is a slave. But I have noticed that my youngest does look at some of these men shouting for liberty and revolution and then looks at himself and wonders if it means the same for him. And it breaks my heart to have to tell him that it doesn't. And one day he might understand that a little differently, but I don't know if he's old enough for me to give him the full explanation of that just yet. And I beg your pardon, I'd, I'd rather not talk about this anymore. It, yeah, that's quite all right, we understand. Um, well, just, uh, t uh, just a few more questions, uh, Mertilla. One, um, Tanya is just very curious, have you ever had the opportunity to uh, interact with any local native women or native people here in the city uh, throughout your time? Uh, I, I have not. I, I do know that there is an encampment not too far outside the city where, uh, where the naturals will come and uh, 
make treaties with the governor and his council, although they haven't done that since, since Lord Dunmore fled the city. Uh, but they also come to pay tribute. Uh, personally, I've never, I've never seen any of their women before, uh, just, just the men folk who come to town. But, but I have heard that, that in some of their communities that the women are, are the ones who are the heads of, of such communities. And I find that to be very interesting. I've, I've never seen... I've never seen a woman be in charge in that way. Well, not personally. I do know of some, of some women who run their own taverns, like Ms. Ms. Vogue or Ms. Christiana Campbell. But I don't know. To, to be a part of a community where women are in charge feels, feels powerful to me. Uh, maybe one day I'll get to meet, meet them, hopefully. <laughs> Indeed. And Margaret J. of uh, Williamsburg um, was curious, knowing that you might never be free, how do you hold on to your sanity? Oh. That's, a, that's a good question, Margaret. Um, I think my faith is what keeps me going. I, I do believe that, that God has a plan for all of this and that I'm here for a reason, even if that reason is to be in bondage. Again, I didn't get to choose my lot in this life, but I think moving forward day by day and having the opportunity to wake up every day, as strange as that sounds, is what keeps me going, to know that I have another opportunity to live another day when so many are, are losing their lives. And Mertilla, our, our final question, we know you have so much um, going on uh, in your day today, but uh, Alyssa asked our final question, what do you hope for the future? No one's ever asked me that before. Uh, I hope that I hope that one day I will wake up and every breath that I breathe will belong to me and nobody else. <laughs> I, um, I hope that my children will grow into amazing men and that they won't have to bow to any other man in the street. And I hope that Myself and my friends and my family and all of those that look like me will get even a small portion of this freedom and these rights that these white people are so adamant to fight for. Because, because if, they can, if they can fight for it, then so can we. If they can demand it, then so can we. That's what I hope for. Oh... And I believe uh, the time has gotten away from me. I do have some, some other uh, chores to get to, but I'd, I certainly thank you all for, for talking to me. Uh, I bid you good day, and God keep you. Thank you all so much for your continued support of Colonial Williamsburg. Thank you to our donors for your generous support that make programs like this possible. We appreciate your viewership and support.